So I got a hold of the Kobo Ellipsa 2E a few days ago, and so I um, figured I'd put together a video just kind of showing it off um, since I have access to it and the, uh, you know, kind of the main changes with the software um, aren't currently available with the um, first edition of the Ellipsa um, as well as the uh, Kobo Sage. Um, so I thought I'd kind of show off some of the stuff that's both on the device as well as um, some of the stuff that uh, you know, in terms of cloud syncing with the notebooks um, is available through their website. So um, I'll kind of run through some of these things and kind of point stuff out that uh, is interesting to me and, and hopefully is useful to kind of, um, you know, understand and, and see some more information about. Um, there are probably going to be some other <laughs> way more in-depth uh, reviews, but um, hopefully this is useful and kind of has its own um, kind of spin on things to kind of give you some more information about um, what all Kobo is up to. All in all, it's it's fairly similar. You're going to hear that across the board. Um, the, the main things for sure um, have to do with their new stylus, which is included. Um, they've changed the, the nib um, so it's no longer um, so clacky. Um, instead, it kind of just spins around freely here um, and uh, is, is a little bit closer to the um, Apple Pencil um, in terms of like design. Um, I've got one here actually, so you can kind of see there's kind of a similarity there um, in terms of the kind of structure of it, the look of it, the feel of it um, in general. It's it's um, a little bit more kind of soft plastic maybe. Um, you can kind of hear kind of some noise to it, whereas um, this kind of has a little bit more slickness to it, um, which makes sense, you know, given, you know, using this on an LCD glass screen um, versus Kobo's kind of more plastic, um, kind of softer screen. So um, it would make sense that they're using different materials there. Um, and then in terms of length, um, the Apple Pencil here is um, a little bit longer, you can see, so um, probably has a lot to do with the kind of device sizes, um, but also probably I'm trying to keep it small and um, easy to use and stuff for the Gobo. Um, so the uh, buttons they've changed, there's now only a single button, which is for doing highlighting, um, and then the eraser is now here on the back. And um, one thing that you'll note is when you're using it, um, the way it gets activated is it gets pressed, so it's kind of button-like in that manner. And so if you have the um, setting for the eraser to be um, kind of a line eraser, you can simply tap on a line and it'll disappear. You don't actually have to do kind of any strokes um, to remove the line. You can actually just tap, um, which is kind of nice because I have found that it it kind of makes an uncomfortable sound given the angle you kind of apply it. Um, if you go straight directly on perpendicular to the kind of screen, then it's a little less kind of um, jarring of a sound. But if you kind of use an angle, these kind of edges around um, the eraser, I find kind of uncomfortable at times depending on, you know, I guess just, you know, <laughs> various circumstances that they kind of make it have um, maybe too much of a paper texture kind of grittiness to it so um, that it's kind of stripping against. So um, something that I am not a huge fan of, I actually prefer the button, um, but, you know, they're, I guess they're trying to simplify and, and you know, this is um, actually similar to the design of the um, Microsoft Surface Pen, um, at least one of the versions that I've seen um, where the eraser's on the back. Um, so all in all, it's, it's, I, I definitely think it's an improvement. Um, I, I really didn't like the nib, um, on the last one. And so this is much quieter and calmer, um, in general. Um, another thing to note here on the nib, um, is that I've been experiencing some scratchiness on this as well. Um, and so I don't know if there's like something wrong with the nib itself. Um, if it's simply wearing down, I, I feel like I do see kind of like a a little bit of something kind of caught on there. So I, I don't know what that's about. Um, hopefully it's just this specific nib and isn't a common problem, but something I've noticed. So when I'm, you know, writing and again, at a certain angle, I, that's when I hear it. It's not all the time. Um, and maybe it's not a big deal. Um, I just think I'm a little bit um, nervous because I'm not necessarily sure I'm going to keep this device. Um, so, you know, I don't want to do any damage to it, but I, I am not sure 
um, if this is a normal experience or not. So something I thought I'd point out, um, would be interested to hear if anyone else has kind of seen anything about that. Um, but they do include two extra nibs, so I, I could swap it out. I just I really don't want to kind of damage any additional nibs if this one is even damaged. I'm not really sure. But um, all in all, like I, I do think it's you know headed in the right direction there. Um, it has a USB-C charger port, um, so that's useful. When you first activate it, you actually um, have to plug it in to get it to kind of connect, I guess, with the device. Um, the... Uh, the cable they give you though, um, you it's not USB-C to USB-C, it's USB-C to USB 2.0, um, which is kind of that more flat kind of style, um, kind of the larger um, last version that we were using on USB. And um, that means that you can't out of the box just simply connect things. You, you have to go find a power adapter block and like connect it or, you know, plug it into a monitor if you've got a USB port there or something like that. Um, so kind of a funny thing, but, you know, all in all, probably not a big deal. And, you know, they probably figured more people have the 2.0 version of a kind of charging block anyway. So um, probably just more accessible that way. Um, the stylus is uh, magnetic. Um, it's magnetic from one side. So the Kobo logo will always be pointing away from the device. Um, but the... Um, both the logo side and the magnet side are a little bit more flat. Again, similar to the Apple Pencil where, um, you know, it keeps it from rolling off the table. Um, but it also has this benefit of um, allowing it to connect um, without rolling too much. The magnet isn't too strong, um, but it's strong enough. Um, I think it's probably more in the middle that it's kind of um, connecting on. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's decent. Um, and you can do it on both sides. So whether you're right or left-handed or have a preference, um, you can decide which side you like better. The magnets on the side can be used. I don't think that's their intention. They're kind of not perfectly aligned all the time. Um, it seems a little bit loose. I think that's more for a cover to kind of snap on. But if you prefer that, you could probably do that as well. So just something I've <laughs> seen some people do that, um, you know, could be could be useful, could be interesting, but yeah, I, I don't think that's their intention there. Um, one thing to point out, there is a sticker here with um, some of these certification logos and um, FCC and all that kind of stuff. And um, I imagine you can peel this off somehow, but I don't know if it'll leave behind a residue. So if you were to do that, you know, it, it's probably a little bit of a risk there. But because it's a sticker, hopefully they've thought about that and they're, they're allowing you to be able to remove it. Other things they've done, they've added natural light so you can warm up your um, screen or you can have it a little bit more neutralized by balancing it in the middle. Um, or you can use what they had on the first edition and just keep it completely cool, kind of just use that regular light there that they've included in the first version. The processor they updated from 1.8 gigahertz to 2 gigahertz, so I guess a little faster there, but they've moved it from being a quad core to a dual core. So, you know, my understanding is that's supposed to make it both snappier and improve the battery life. Um, so hopefully that's a good thing overall. The power button um, here on this side has apparently changed. I've, I've never used the uh, first edition, but um, apparently this was hard to find. And so there's a little bit of a texture there. And um, so that's kind of nice. You can easily feel it. You kind of know where it is um, as you kind of um, feel along the side there. So um, works pretty quickly and um, easy to use there. The back um, now has kind of a, a texture here. You know, you can kind of see, you know, my sweaty hands <laughs> have left some residue. But overall, the device does a decent job with the kind of um, reflectivity and the smudginess that um, can be kind of seen there. Um, I, I felt like it, it was a little bit more noticeable on the Kobo Sage. I don't know if the original Ellipsa um, was similar to this, but um, overall, I feel like it, it it's decent. It's, you know, you're always going to kind of run into that problem. And I, I think that the texture that they've applied to the screen um, is is fairly nice and has, has a decent writing feel. Overall, I, you know, I, I find it to be, you know, pretty 
pretty nice. The overall experience of the notebooks has been fine. Um, the the speed and the lag of the writing is um, okay. Um, I'm now at 68 pages. Um, I uh, I started to notice that um, last night while I kind of continued to kind of fill out more pages that I was starting to know a couple kind of glitches. Usually by the time I got down to this kind of last quarter of the page um, was where I was starting to notice some things going on. It might have had to do with the wrist detection, um, the palm rejection, whatever you want to call it, um, where when I was writing, I would notice it would jump and make kind of like um, like it would follow along and like connect, um, you know, one end point to the next point I was drawing um, or writing. Like I, I didn't intend for that to happen. Um, so that was kind of an odd thing there. In terms of uh, 10.3 inch, um, this is really enjoyable um, as, as something to write on overall. Um, the, the nice thing about it is you, you have more space to kind of rest your hand. Um, so versus the Sage, I really felt like, you know, this was great to sit out on the patio and um, kind of have this, you know, on my lap and, and be writing and, um, you know, just way more comfortable, um, you know, not having to like hold the device so much and, you know, have my hand kind of lifted above the screen or running out of space as I got lower, um, you know, as you're writing, you know, you're, you're getting to about this point and that's where you start to get into that kind of similar experience that you have on an eight inch device where you kind of run out of space and you have to kind of figure out, okay, where's your hand going to go? Overall, the screen um, has been a decent experience. Um, I was a little bit concerned about the 227 um, PPI. Um, I'm, you know, used to 300 now from, you know, 7.8 and 8 inch devices um, that um, all have kind of received, you know, kind of the upgrades over the past years. Um, unfortunately, the market really doesn't have a lot of 300 PPI, so um, this has been pretty common um, for most devices. Um, but it is interesting that they decided to go forward with um, updating the device, given that the updates are fairly minor um, and that the Kindle Scribe has a 300 PPI screen. So um, I've seen some people kind of discussing why why it is that Kobo launched this. And my assumption is that one price point had to do with it, um, because if they're removing the cover and still charging the same price, it suggests they're trying to bump up the kind of um, money that I guess they're able to make off of the device by reducing what you're getting with it, um, reducing what they have to provide with it, um, while still making some upgrades. So by removing the screen, adding the extra light, um, and adding in kind of like a little bump in the kind of CPU level, um, it, it's it's so kind of minimal that it, it kind of makes me think had they added a 300 ppi screen how much more expensive would it have been given that um, not a lot of other companies are doing it so maybe that value to them wasn't there and that was a reason they decided like the more important thing would be the things that they've done um, and to continue to incrementally improve the devices over time instead of everyone rushing out to get the newest best thing every single year or year and a half, um, potentially as, as trying to think out what would their strategy be? Why, why are they approaching it in the way that they're approaching it? So that's my guess as to why they might've done that. Um, but overall, like it's fine, like 227, I've not noticed it being too disappointing or ugly or whatever. Um, the uh, thing that I do tend to do um, in order to increase the darkness of the fonts and um, just to improve the overall feeling is to kind of adjust the weight, um, which I think helps to make it feel like it is a little bit more bold and crisp. Um, so by doing that, it makes me feel like a little bit better about it all. Um, you know, the lighting as you kind of shift it will change how your kind of experience of the kind of crispness and the clarity of the screen. Um, but uh, 
I will say, I'm, because I've not seen a 300 PPI e-ink screen at this scale, it does make me not really have a huge opinion on how much I'm missing out on. So ignorance is bliss, I guess. So I'm going to go ahead and run through some of the feature changes for the notebooks. Uh, as you can see here, they've got folders now available. Um, the way you create folders is by the same way that you create a new notebook, except now there's an option to add in a new folder. Um, so I've done that here just out of curiosity, like, you know, how does it, how does it flow when you do this? and uh, into a secondary kind of page or something. And what they do is they use the scroll bar similar to the My Books section. So you're able to drag on that to jump around, um, whether by finger or by stylus. Um, and it kind of has this little indication to let you know what page you're on. Um, and uh, when you click on the ellipsis for the folder, um, kind of options. You can re rename it, you can move it, or you can delete it. So um, you can actually put uh, folders into folders, which is helpful. Um, so I can kind of clear these out here and um, put them deeper in. Um, let's see here. I've not actually seen how many levels deep you can go. So yeah, so you can do folders and folders. Um, so if I go in here, um, do another, and so forth. Um, I'm not sure what the limit is. I'm sure at a certain point it probably isn't even going to be in usable based on the fact that you have to kind of go in one by one by one, um, and there's not an easy way to kind of jump in um, way deeper. You just have to kind of go one at a time, which is probably a little bit um, difficult to work with there. <clears throat> so jumping back out, uh, <clears throat> so jumping back up to the top, um, we have the ability to download all or to cancel all downloads. So um, I imagine that if you were using a secondary device, um, this would have to do with syncing a notebook from device one to device two. So um, because I don't have anything in the background, um, no other devices that have created a notebook, I assume that's why this is grayed out, um, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, so whenever you sync, um, everything, it will include uh, your updates to your individual notebooks um, if you have gone into your settings. And I don't remember exactly how they do this when you first get it, but Sync My Notebooks is an option over here. And so if you toggle it on, it syncs everything. So important thing to note here is that there's no optional folder that isn't synced or optional notebook that isn't synced. It's, it's all or nothing. And so the reason I point that out is I've seen, you know, people try and use eNotes for work. And depending on your job, you may have data that you're writing into a notebook that you do not want to be placed on a server that isn't totally secure. So if you're, you know, a medical professional or um, if you're, you know, doing some kind of work where, you know, the data that you're taking notes on is secure information, whether it's about products that you're building or people um, that you shouldn't be writing out their information, um, it's important for you to note that you you can't not sync it. And what I don't know, and I, I would assume that it's probably very, like, I guess, simple in terms of its security level, um, that your content isn't necessarily stored on it, like an encrypted um, server with a bunch of like HIPAA, you know, level rules. It's, it's probably just fairly secure would be my guess. Um, I, I'll look into it. I'll, I'll see if I can find any more information about Kobo Cloud, but that is where they're storing um, your synced notebooks. So just something to be aware of may not really be a major deal to most people, but, um, if you don't know now, you know, um, you know, just, just a factor that, um, comes into play when you start dealing with cloud and syncing, um, is how, how protected is your information. So basically don't write in your social security number because 
that's going to be a risk. Another thing to note is they have added in the ability to do search. Um, however, as you can see here, you've got a search icon. Um, let's see here. Does it exist when you go home? You get up to home for some reason. Yeah, so this exists everywhere. And as you can see, you can search for title, author, series, or ISBN um, across the Kobo store. You can go into my books and search across title, author, or series, but you don't have the ability to search for specific content from your notebook. So I have annotations here, and I know that the search for fave should appear from the notebooks, but that's not available. So they're not adding it here at this point. Um, I believe I did write the word ellipsa in an annotation. So these annotations may actually be typed annotations. These may not be actually written out, um, handwritten um, ones. So um, something to note there is that this search icon is simply for the pre-existing search. Um, it's, it's just about titles and files. Um, it's not actually about uh, Dropbox files, though, that haven't been synced. Um, so that's, that's an important thing to note there as well. If you are getting onto your Dropbox account and you haven't downloaded um, a specific file, so I'll go here to one of these and I've got atomichabits.pdf. So from here, I type atomic habits. See, it's my books. So that's that's different than yeah, Dropbox. So Dropbox is not included. So any of your PDFs, any of your side loaded um, Dropbox stored. Um, EPUB files are not available inside the search there, nor are notebooks. So this is very selective. It's very book oriented and annotations. That's a nice one to have, but it's only typed. So just, just being aware of that and what they're doing here is they've only added in search on the level of the notebook that you're inside of. So if I come here, now I have the search icon. It's the same icon, but when I come in here, now I have different options. It's current notebook. So potentially they would have that ability to search across all notebooks, but that is like a CPU, a RAM kind of challenge where the processing power to search across however many notebooks that you've got available, um, they're going to have to do that. So for now, it seems like they're just simply starting at the notebook that you're currently in. You can search for keywords. So um, we have my keyword of fave. And I've written that on several pages. And as you see, the results start to populate as it discovers the keyword match. And so it displays the results very um, kind of quickly there. And I've only got one page. Let me go ahead and actually let's, let's add a couple more um, just to have it. So we'll go back to search. And we'll tap on fave. And let's see here. I'm going to test one thing here really quickly. When it gives me the first result, let's see if it lets me jump in immediately. Okay, I'm a little slower right now. There we go. Okay, so you can jump in immediately. That's great. And because I tapped it, I stopped the search. So it no longer is searching across the results, even though we know there are more than three. So we'll go ahead and start again. So that's just something to, you know, Kind of point out how does this function what's going on here um, i like to know those things just to understand um, you know what is the the kind of backbone of the technology what is it actually doing um, and given that like i've previously searched this um, the fact that it's populating somewhat slowly um, shows that it is searching just in case you wrote again. So they, they're truly going through, it seems, and trying to discover um, any new additions to your notebook, which I think is a good thing um, that, you know, it's not going to overlook something that maybe you added in. So um, nice thing about this here is that they're presenting you all the results. So you have a visible example, so you know, you know, what it is. And if you tap in, 
one of the nice things too is that you've got all of the results that you had previously. You've got the keyword that you entered. You've got kind of a, a navigation through individual results and you can tap through and find um, the result that you had prior. Um, so you're tapping one by one, you can go back and forth, which is really handy because had they not done this, that means I would have had to exit out, go into search again, you know, redo this all. So by creating this experience, what they're doing is allowing you to investigate all the results, which I think is a really smart move because say you're taking project notes about a single project and you want to go find it scattered throughout your notebook. And you can do that here. Um, one thing I'll note is uh, I was not aware that it was still searching. So there's no indication here um, that I can see that the search is ongoing. So if I were to kind of give up um, and click in, it would immediately stop the search and only the results that I have would be there. So that's a downside that I can kind of see here um, in terms of the experience. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that it's like, if I want every single result to be there, I have to wait. And I also have to wait, um, I guess, really kind of just knowing the page count, you know, if it got to, you know, the last page that I knew a certain keyword existed, great. But if I don't know that, you know, you're, you're kind of in the dark there, you're, you're not fully clear on what's going on. But all in all, you know, for, you know, a, a first kind of launch of this kind of a functionality, um, really good start. Um, really helpful to see some of those things going on in terms of um, their handling of those things. And, you know, the fact that they highlight and help you find like, okay, where is that keyword? Oh, there it is. Like, you know, maybe I wouldn't have seen it. Um, and potentially they have a mismatch. And so they like um, may, you know, highlight something that actually doesn't say fave. And then you'd be kind of like, okay, where where are you saying fave is? And, and and it was because they they misjudged your writing, perhaps. And so because they highlight it, it's indicating this is what they saw as a match, and um, lets you find which one they're talking about. Um, especially given there might be multiple matches on a single page, so just kind of clarifying that I think is really smart. And as you can see, it only matches these two. Um, my writing here is not coming through as fave, and so it said, sorry, good luck, um, try again. So um, there are some cases where, you know, my handwriting is just not, not easy for anyone to read. So, you know, that's just the reality there. The other thing is the lasso tool. So I really think this is a great addition and is the foundation that I think will be important for the further development of the notebooks. Selecting something and moving it around, that's fine. You know, you may not be very excited about that. Um, but the, the really important thing that, um, the SDK they're building on top of by MyScript is the company that makes the app called Nebo, N-E-B-O. And their tool does a lot more. Um, and so it seems like bit by bit, the SDK is being embedded in Kobo's software. And so Lasso is something they already have, but they also have cut and paste um, inside of that tool set. So here, as you can see, it's just simply about selecting certain lines and being able to move them around. That's helpful in terms of reorganizing your notes, making you know the alignment a little bit better, all that kind of stuff. But that's where it stops. There's nothing more you can do. You can't tap on it to select anything else. Um, but in the future, what I'm hoping they do is allow me to copy and then potentially go to another page and, you know, paste it. Um, there are a lot of like UX aspects that have to be figured out. Like if I paste um, inside of here, will it still be selected? Where will it drop it on the page? Um, all that kind of stuff is, is important. Um, but, you know, they can copy, they could paste, they could duplicate. There are a lot of things they could do. Um, also, there's potential that like I could change the color of the text. So if I just want to write in black and just, you know, finish writing um, and then come back around and change potentially the type of tool that I have applied to those strokes, the line weight, 
um, the, the shade that I have applied, like all of those things now could be done because they've added the lasso tool. This is huge for being able to do more um, kind of editing functionality. Um, but for now, you know, as a start, being able to move things around, I think is really helpful. Um, and, you know, it works fairly quickly here. Um, you know, there are weird things that are going to happen because of e-ink screens and refresh rates and stuff like that. Um, but they do a good job to kind of refresh, um, recalibrate, make sure that it looks as clean as possible to remove the ghosting. Um, but the fact that you can, you know, fairly easily see this as you move it around um, lets you know, you know, hey, your placement has been done um, in the space that you want it to be, and that's great. So great start there. Um, you know, good to see them continuing to add in more things that I know are available in this SDK um, to make this a more powerful experience um, instead of it just simply being about like writing and that's it. Like you can't change after you've written. You can either erase it and rewrite it or whatever else. So that's that's a nice kind of um, next step in the kind of evolution of um, their their application here. So in terms of other aspects of the notebook software, they have added multiple um, backgrounds. Um, one thing to note is that these backgrounds are not exported and they are not synced um, into the web view on the Kobo cloud. So um, I'll show that here. So you just basically come over to their account menu and where you have my books underneath it would be my notebooks. And so everything I've synced in um, is displayed here. It's all just simply every single notebook in a single view. Um, so the folder structure disappears at this point. When you go in, you'll find fairly um, similar in terms of the line work for the um, ballpoint pen um, that they've got there. However, on other brushes, um, the output is slightly different. Um, you'll also notice that the template is not displayed behind your annotation. So it's simply an output of your writing, which I guess is important if you're really relying on the structure of any of these page backgrounds. Some of them, you know, have kind of like little sidebars or, for example, you know, there's kind of like a, a weekly grid that I've written over the top of, but, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, kind of a structure. And um, if, if you're really hoping for, you know, that to help add that structure, um, that won't display here. So you'd have to kind of draw it yourself. So yeah, there's a difference there. Um, one thing I'm noting is uh, that the sync, um, I'm not sure how long it takes. Um, I've, uh, I've refreshed a few times. It's been about maybe five minutes so far. That's one thing to note. And, and maybe I just haven't changed enough. So, you know, let me just go ahead and keep keep on writing but yeah as you can see here also um the uh let me find a good example here so um here i've got you know this here down in the corner and you know this is the whole page and so what it's doing it appears is it's clipping um around the content probably adding a little bit of padding and then centering it here on this view at least on my ipad so you know it, it may differ per kind of device and screen you're using. But, uh, you know, if I were to add this here, it'll probably zoom it out the next time it syncs. So um, just stuff that they're doing is kind of interesting to show, like, you know, how, how they're treating it currently. Maybe, maybe that changes over time. Um, not a huge deal, but just in case you were curious, that's, that's kind of how it works. One thing that overall in the notebooks that I think they really could use next is like, not just a skimmer that I have to remember what's on each page, but a page overview. Um, I think it makes it really difficult to kind of know as I get to 70 pages, if I wanted to use this as say like a journal throughout a year um, or a planner, like that's going to be kind of difficult to find.
find something as quickly as if I could see a grid of a certain number of pages in a similar fashion as, you know, when you're looking at your notebooks, you know, it's kind of a zoomed out view, you have thumbnails. Um, but right now, I don't have any kind of indication to tell me um, in the way that they treat their um, ebooks, for example, that could also be helpful. But what I would really like is, is kind of that whole zoomed out view. So, you know, here, I would be able to look ahead, basically. But, uh, you know, they have the ability to step forward and step back um, per page. Um, and so that kind of functionality would be useful, but also to just see all of these panels all at once for um, a notebook would be really nice to have. You may not remember what content you have. You just know what it looks like, for example. So, you know, search is helpful. It gets you closer to that. But um, that visual, I think, is, is a really important thing to have in order to kind of discover something that you're looking for. And especially because I can't search through all of my notebooks I have to go in individually into each one. So, you know, you really have to build this properly to make sure that you can find the thing that you're looking for in the future. I have signed in again in private mode. So hopefully that will force me to have to re-download any imagery. Um, and hopefully that helps with seeing the latest changes that I've made and synced. Here we go. So it, it might have been my iPad. So that's that's helpful to know. Um, so I, you know, I'm here in the private mode here um, versus here. Um, I am logged in on kind of like the regular kind of version of, of viewing. It, it does seem to be browser based and not necessarily an issue with their syncing service. But um, as we can see here now, we can finally test in on which are the specific tools that are not coming through as they come through here over on the actual Kobo device. So the fountain pen, as you can see, has a slightly different kind of thick and thin kind of difference here. This is this gets much more thin. This stays somewhat uniform. There is a little bit of tapering, though. And then here over on the brush side, similar issues where it comes through just pretty straightforward. And then there is a little bit more of a thinness um, that appears to happen with the calligraphy pen, but um, it's not quite the same as the device. Overall, the, the ballpoint pen appears to be mostly the same, but um, some of the as other um, kind of outputs are a little bit different. So this being thinner um, makes it pretty unreadable because I've written, I guess, smaller than they were expecting, or this, this is just simply a, a bug. So I didn't fully give the advanced notebook a chance so far and figured I should give it a try um, and see how it works. Oh, so I've already learned something. The uh, the basic notebook, I've not noticed that you can flip um, to landscape mode, but here, I guess because it has scrolling, it, it doesn't really matter um, about it being in a different orientation because it has that ability to deal with scrolling um, versus basic. It's just the page, so they decided there's going to be a difference between the two. The thing that I was running into the other day was not really knowing what all I can do. So I've learned that, you know, obviously you can convert um, text, but um, one thing I wasn't aware of was these kind of different modes within your editing of converted text. So, um, let me get some text down here. Okay, so lots of text, different styles of um, writing tools, and it all just converts the same. So it's, I guess it's really just a matter of preference. Um, this did happen to me the other day, and I wasn't really sure what it was. So it might turn that into an emoji and maybe that emoji just simply isn't available, but maybe it's able to convert because it has like an understanding of general 
common emojis. That I'm not really sure. So there's a menu item of edit, and when you hit edit, it makes it larger. So if you use a line through, it breaks into a new line, um, and you can do that um, kind of anywhere. Um, when you click finish, it goes back to the smaller text. And what I found out is you can also edit there as well. Um, if you cross something out, you can edit. Um, so pretty, oh, it just got the eye there. <laughs> okay. So it's struggling a bit to understand what I'm trying to do at times. But because it's small, it does make it probably more difficult. Maybe I'm just supposed to strike through one time. Oh, I made that bold. I literally have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but it's funny because it's like there's so many things you could do. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm aware that if you do an outline, it will highlight your text. So pretty, pretty cool features. Um, if you strike through once, it gets rid of it. You bold it if you underline it. So these things make sense now. And I, I guess the purpose of having this edit state would be that it's larger and easier to edit, but generally you may want the copy to be smaller so it's easier to read and you have more on a single page. So I guess that would be the reason there. The, uh, the diagrams, um, I was just actually learning that you can actually write text in there, which um, is handy if you were, you know, trying to make kind of like a mind map of sorts. Um, it doesn't know what I'm trying to do here. Um, I found out that the eraser here um, can affect, affect the actual converted text. Um, when you write kind of a circle, it fills it in, but if you double tap it again, it turns it into an actual kind of um, more mathematical version of it. Um, so that's kind of your way of dealing with that. Um, and then it, you know, in a nice way, it, it kind of lets you resize things as well. Um, so if you tap on it, you're kind of given this menu. You can turn it into more of an ellipsis. I don't know if it knows that's a full shape. Um, but all in all, pretty handy, pretty, pretty cool. Um, Kind of interesting, like I've noticed that when you go over the top of something, it kind of connects some things at times. Um, I don't know if they have to fully be in there, but I was discovering that, yeah, it grabbed it. So it's like inside the car right now when we're going for a drive. So like if you were, oops. Oh yeah, this kind of gets weird here, <laughs> like what level am I in? So I'm selecting the whole drawing instead of just an element on the drawing. But like if you cross paths with things, like at what point does it grab it? I, f I feel like I thought I saw it grab it a little too early, but kind of interesting. Um, in general, I think I'm more of the basic notebook kind of user but that doesn't mean I can't use something like this on occasion. The other thing I came across was, um, you know, the math. I thought you had to add an equal sign for it to understand, but it actually spits it out no matter what. Um, there was a weird thing where when I was doing like a few different really basic formulas, because I don't know math very well, I noticed like one plus one had two, 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 like overlaid on one another. Um, which was kind of weird. Um, so, uh, no, it's supposed to be a square root. Sure. Um, yeah, so see, you can see 1 plus 1 equals 2 equals 1. So I don't know if these are, like, interacting with each other or how that works, but um, you can kind of continue filling in above and... 
um, you know, it allows you to. So, you know, I could see this as being something like if you're kicking back and trying to like do the budget on your credit card to go, okay, what math do I need to do to figure out where we're, you know, landing for the end of the month so I can pay that part of the bill and keep my numbers separate for months because that's the kind of weird stuff I do. Um, other things that I haven't really quite figured out, I've, I've got these these little grabby things. Um, I thought it was for resizing. There we go. So you may just have to be in a certain state, but having it on the top makes it kind of confusing. I guess it's maybe also to just inform me that um, that that's the size, like that's that's the start of it. I may have confused it. Okay, there we go. So if I grab it when it's not selected, it, it seems to kind of understand like I meant to grab it. Well, maybe not. So there's some things that I, I'm making this software look difficult, but I just, I honestly haven't read any of it. Um, maybe it is difficult, I don't actually know. So really quickly, I wanted to kind of show the Readwise setup. So Readwise is kind of like in the middle of your books, your content, and then your note-taking apps and kind of being in the middle, kind of a spoke wheel sort of a setup to kind of pull in and spit out so you have access to it. So as you can see, there are different integ integrations that you can add. Um, you can even just simply take a photo of, you know, if you've got a physical book or something else that you see in real life, or maybe you've saved to your device, you can just simply add it to their system and then be able to handle it that way. So Kobo has added this way to basically export the annotations you've made. So whether that's a highlight that you make there, or if you also want to add in a note, um, you can do that, and that would then be available once you sync over. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the speed at which I, from the iPad app at least, I'm, I'm not finding a way to kind of see the list of all the different books that I've made notes on. Um, you can't like force from what I can see so far. It basically gives you a, a, a list of quotes and highlights and notes that you've made about your highlights that you can kind of flip through and say, yeah, that's interesting. Or like, um, don't show me again, like this highlight is not actually useful anymore. Or, you know, um, I just don't need it here in this system. You can discard it um, and kind of continue moving on. Um, you can also do some editing things to kind of change the formatting of it, um, as well as adding some personal comments um, and kind of going from there. And so once you're done, you've done your work for the day, you've reviewed your highlighting. Um, and um, the main idea here is that by reviewing things that you've highlighted, you can use that as a study tool. Um, somewhere I saw they had referenced this idea of spaced repetition. And so by reviewing throughout the week, throughout your days, that you can um, better understand concepts and ideas that you're studying and interested in. So that's the main idea there. But in mastery, I guess, is going a little bit deeper and, and you can say, oh, what are those four words that I'm missing there? So if you tap on it, you find, oh, standards of UX research. So that was a keyword I was trying to master and, you know, either I got it or I didn't. And, you know, you can remove it from your highlights there. So kind of an interesting study tool. Um, it does cost money, though. You, you can do it for 30 days as a trial. But um, after that, I think it's like $10 a month, maybe more, depending on the levels that which you're paying for. Maybe there's a cheaper one, but I um, just thought I'd show that because I was kind of curious what what that would mean, how that works. Um, but if you don't want to you know, pay for something like that, I mean, you, you do have access to your information here. Um, you can filter by the different types of highlights and markups and stuff that you've made. Um, so if you are writing things out, whether on your iPad or here on your Kobo, um, if you've got a note-taking Kobo, um, you can view, you know, specifically filtered down to those types. What it doesn't appear to do, though, from what I've seen so far, is any of your kind of handwritten um, annotations, I don't think those sync over. 